recording? All right, good. We're going to get started. We're going to get into the second session, or second section, um, here of the manual. We're going to get into uh, how and why I entered the ministry by Curry Willick. So Curry's just going to share with us here, um, he's not here, but he's going to share with us here on these papers, um, of just how he received the ministry, honestly, and what, what had happened uh, in his life. Um, and like I said, like, take time and read that prophecy on page 27 and, and 28. It kind of finishes up around 28. But it, it, shows, it shows how everything lined up with, with, you know, Curry Blake taking over, you know, John Lake's ministry. John, you know, basically John Lake had prophesied that uh, there'd be, you know, a young man that would take over the ministry. Um, and, and, and just so you all know, too, uh, this ministry really laid dormant um, for, I believe, about 80, 80 years, I maybe 70 to 80 years. Uh, after Lake had died, that was one of the things that happened. You know, one of the saddest things, honestly, that probably happened was number one that nobody picked it up and ran with it, and DHG just kind of fizzled off, and the whole healing message just kind of you know fizzled off itself. But uh, Lake had a son uh, that after Lake had passed away, Lake's son had gotten uh, very sick uh, and was on his deathbed. And <clears throat> one of the things that you know Brother Curry had talked about, and even at Texas, I think he touched on a little bit, I think, but you know. He talked about leaving behind a legacy and leaving behind with our children this message, right? And because one of the things that Lake's son had said was on his deathbed, he said, if my father, is, if my father could be here, I know I wouldn't have to die. And that's sad, you know, because here is, you know, John Lake with this, this, this amazing man of God who ran with this ministry, who established these healing rooms, who, who got the revelation of, you know, God is healing today, you know, and he does, he does heal, you are healed, you know. And he ran with it, and he ministered healing to hundreds of thousands of people, and yet his son didn't grasp the message. You know, and that was probably, honestly, one of Lake's downfalls, was not leaving behind the, the message, not leaving behind a legacy. Uh, one of the things that Brother Curry encouraged us to start doing, and I would encourage you to do in your own personal ministry, is start journaling, um, start recording these testimonies, take pictures. I mean, especially if the people would allow it, you know, I mean, take pictures, you know, ask them to do a little... We have the best journal like, right here. Like, hey, you know, you just got your leg healed. Can you give a testimony? You, do you mind giving a testimony? Have them record it. Record that testimony. Why? Because you'll have those things to pass on to your children and your grandchildren and to say, look what God did. And, and Brother Craig talked about it. He says, I've got a book. He says, I've got books from when he's been in South Africa and different countries and even in the U.S. And, you know, people like he said, the one, one picture he's got in a one book, he said, I've got a man with a withered hand. He says, and I, and I got my hand picture of me laying hands on it. He says, and I got a picture like two days later at the next service. He's like, it's, it's completely working, right? And he's like, I want to be able to sit down with my grandkids and say, you know, your Paul laid his hands on that man's hand, and two days later, it's completely restored. Why? Because you can do that too, right? And it got, why? Because God's no respecter of persons, you know? So we need to leave behind that legacy for our children so that way when we're gone, they can continue to run the race. It's, it's that baton that we pass on, right? We finished our, 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 our lap, right? And now it's time for you to do your lap. Right? And so we need to leave that behind for our children. So um, again, that's kind of why we're going over some of this historic stuff too, you know, the, the history behind all this, because it's important. We need to know what, what baton we're grabbing a hold of, right? And so we'll look at Curry's, some of Curry's stuff. He was born in uh, April 1st, 1959. <clears throat> Excuse me. He was an only child, uh, still is an only child. Um, he says, uh, when I was 17 months old, uh, we were at a family reunion. And my, as my father was leaving... Um, I slipped out the door and was behind the car without, uh, without seeing, without, and, and car without him seeing me. Uh, he backed out and ran Curry over, ran him over. He was only, uh, yeah, 17 months old. Um, basically, when he ran him over, it, it basically scalped him. Uh, I believe it was from his right ear. To this day, if you actually look at Curry's, if you were close enough, you look at his head, he's, he's actually got a scar. It's underneath his hairline. You can't see it, but it's a scar basically from this ear to that ear. It basically took this ear off. And basically took all the skin and everything off to the other side. When his father heard the noise, his father had jumped out of the car, seen that Curry was actually up underneath the wheel well, between the car and the, and the tire, runs back in the house and says, I've killed, our, I've killed our baby. I've killed our baby. Curry's grandfather runs out of the house, gets Curry out from underneath the car, picks up his ear, which is now also on the ground. They drive him to a local hospital. Actually, it says on here they... Grandfather ran out, picked him up, took him to the local hospital, which was just a couple miles away. They get to the hospital, and basically doctors say that he'll never live. That's the first word. That's the first, let's put it this way. That's the first doctor's report they get. He'll never live. That's what he tells his mom. Now, his mom, 
uh, his, <laughs> I think his father was followed more Baptist, but his mom was a Pentecostal, right? And so his mom went to praying, and that's because that's what a Pentecostal woman does. She goes to pray him, and uh, so they tell him first he can't live, and then they, he, she goes to pray, and the doctor comes back out a little bit later and says, well, you know, if he lives, he'll be a vegetable, right? And his mom said, well, that's not good enough, so she goes to praying some more. Um, they come back out a little while later after she's praying, because they're, they're, he's in the surgery room, they're doing surgery on him, trying to get everything repaired, fixed back up, and um, they said, well, he said, there's no signs of brain damage, right? But the doctor also said that he'll, have, he'll never have hair or hearing. He won't be able to hear. So mom says, well, that's not good enough again. So he goes to praying again. She goes to praying again. Well, six hours later and 172, 172 stitches later, uh, he was completely fine. And to this day, he, you know, he said, you know, I'm normal. And, and I actually, one of, the, one of the DHTs I watched, he said, you know, that's, that, some of my family tells me that's up for debate, whether I'm normal or not. You know? But he says, to this day, I am normal. He says he, he has no hearing problems, has no problems at all. I mean, uh, no, yeah, no loss of hair. He's got a full head of hair. Yeah, I mean, not, no issues at all. I mean, what the doctor said said did not come to pass because of a praying mom. You know, praise God. But this, the reason I said to read this prophecy is because if you look at it, and we'll get into this as, as we're going down here, we're going to look at the timeline of things. This lines up, this date and this time this, uh, of, of the, 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 him being ran over by the car, lines up with Lake's prophecy of when this young man's life would try to be taken, right? And so we'll, you'll see that as we go through this, this timeline here. But um, he was taught to read by using the King James Bible. That's how he learned how to read. He learned how to, you know, this is one of the word. His mom had him read it. He read the Bible four times before even starting school. Uh, he was saved at the age of nine years, nine years old. Uh, and when he graduated high school, he went into the U uh, U.S. Air Force. Uh, he was in the Security Police Pararescue Division. Um, he went, you know, even in the, min even in the military, he knew that wasn't what he was called to do. He knew he was always called to preach the gospel. He was Baptist, but he also knew that God could heal. Uh, he met and married his wife, Dawn, uh, Dawn Blake. Um, and I'm not sure how long they've been married, but they've been married a long time. He met, his, met and married his wife. Uh, we actually got to meet Dawn in down Texas, a uh, sweet, sweet woman of God. Uh, first child was born, was, uh, her name was Erica Dawn Blake, uh, born November 17th, 1978. She was born, now when she was, the, the, here's the thing, she was born with a hemangioma tumor. Um, when she was born, and I've heard Curry talk about this, there was no, they had no idea that she was going to be born with that. There was, from all imaging and everything, all the tests they had done that day, it, it caught the doctors by surprise. When she was born, I mean, she was born, it was, the hemangioma tumor was actually on her tongue. Um, it was a huge, and if you know anything about a hemangioma tumor, it's, it's a tumor that's made out of blood vessels. Uh, and so basically it's just a, a big wad of veins, if you want to call it that. And so this, this big tumor of veins is literally on her tongue, and it's, it's protruding out of her mouth. And so it, it caught everybody by surprise. Like I said, we had, they, had, they, they said they had no idea that it was on there. The doctors had no idea she was going to be born with that. Um, and honestly, this, this is, you know, I told you about John Lake's why. This is Curry's why. This is what pushed him to go to divine healing. This is what pushed him. To, he knew God could heal. He, like I say, he was raised Baptist, and he knew God could heal, but he didn't have the full reality of what healing looked like. So it pushed him to begin studying healing. Uh, he said he trained under some of the best. He said they got some results, but not enough. And um, he talks about that. He says, you know, there was times where, um, you know, they saw the tumor shrink and get smaller as they were commanding and as they were doing things and, you know, doing some of the things that they learned, and then it would grow back, and then it would shrink, and it would grow back, and it would shrink more and shrink more. He says, and unfortunately, you know, we didn't learn enough fast enough, and we weren't successful fast enough. We were successful to a degree um, because his daughter uh, ended up dying on, um, uh, uh, yeah, actually, has Erica died February 13, 1981. Um, one of the things, you know, it was, he, he said, you know, it was, it was a lie. It really pushed them. He says, number one, it, it stretched him and his wife because they had to learn how to take care of her. It was very, it was very sensitive thing. It had to keep it moist. They had to keep, you know, they actually made a thing that covered it because they said when it went out in town or shopping or whatever and it had the stroller, I mean, everybody would just stop and stare because it was, it was not a pretty sight. So they actually, I think it was her mom actually made, or made these things that would cover it and the child could wear over her face. And he said, you know, like any, you know, one, two-year-old, you know, you get agitated with something on your face, you get to pull it. He says, we could actually tell as we're shopping that she had pulled it down because everybody's faces were looking at her, right? And so he says it was this horrible thing, honestly. And he says, and it drove them to want to destroy that off of their daughter. And so he called everyone. He trained them the best. They got some results. They also had a son who was born on March, his name is John, born on March 9th, 1980. 
Erica did die, though, on February 13, 1981. When his, he knew his daughter was dying, he said, I called everyone. I called everyone I knew. I called every minister. He says, and every time the secretaries picked up the phone or the churches picked up the phone or this person picked up the phone, everybody was too busy. Nobody called me back. Nobody could get back to me. He says, I called everyone, wanting everyone to help my daughter. He says, because who wouldn't want someone to help their daughter? If your daughter's dying, you would do anything to keep your daughter from dying, your child from dying. So he says, I called everyone I could. I, I couldn't find anybody to help my daughter. and never, Nobody would ever return my call. So he said, you know, they had, when, when his daughter died, he had two options. They could uh, remove the, hum- the tumor, and, you know, that way she could, you know, wouldn't look like that in the casket. And they could have, you know, three days later have a normal funeral where they, they had the option of burying her quickly, you know, if they didn't, because they honestly didn't know what it would do and what it would be. And, and so him and his wife sat and talked, and they made the decision that, that no, she's, you know, going to go into the ground. That's what she was born. She's going into the ground that way. They're not removing anything. And so they buried her on the next day, buried her on February 14th, Valentine's Day of 1981. Uh, Valentine's Day for Brother Curry is a day he'll always remember. You know, it's one of those days when things like that happen. You know, you never forget those days. And so every Valentine's Day rolls around, he remembers that, and you know, in a good way. It's not like he relives that and thinks, you know, it's you know, he remembers it a good way. And Brother Curry even talks about it. You know, what one of the things that drove him to healing was this, and that's probably the main thing that really drove him to healing. But there was time. He said there was times, especially in the beginning, when I was just like I wanted to kick the devil's teeth in. You know, and it just pushed me to destroy sickness and disease even more. And he says there would even be times when I would minister to people. He said, and I would, I would say, you know, Erica, this is for you. And I'd lay my hands, right? And by to remind the enemy, you took my daughter, and now you're going to pay for it, right? And so uh, his second daughter <clears throat> was born um, October 20th, 1981. Her name is Crystal. Um, and then they had a third daughter, uh, Angela Rebecca Lake. I think she goes by Rebecca but she was born November 6th, 1982. Um, you know, Curry made a vow to God. He talks about that standing that day on Valentine's Day in McKinney, Texas, burying his daughter. He said, I made a vow to God to find answers and to help others. Why? Because he says, nobody should have a grave like I have. No, no parent should have a grave. And so he made a vow to God, the Father, if you would teach me everything about healing, he says, I will help others. I will, I will be that man. That was one of the things he said. He says, I will be that man for someone else because there was nobody there for me that day. So he studied all the healing evangelists, Wigglesworth. He studied Wigglesworth, uh, found Wigglesworth to be amazing, but Wigglesworth never reproduced. He heard of Lake. Uh, you know, one of the things about John Lake is he did it, he taught it, and he reproduced it. Searched more info and found Lake's daughter and son-in-law. Uh, that was uh, Gertrude and Wilford Wright. Um, that was Gertrude was Lake's daughter and uh, Wilford was his son-in-law. He found out he just through through uh, you know phone books and stuff because they didn't have you know couldn't just jump on the internet back then. And he found through phone books and stuff. He found their phone number and began to call them, and they ended up having weekly phone calls. And he would sit. He's like, I would sit. He's like, brother Curry's like, I would sit at the table with a notebook and I'd be on the phone with you know his daughter and his son-in-law and just every asking them all because he says and he says the crazy thing is the more questions I had and the more questions I got answered, you know the more actually the more questions I got answered. He says the more questions I had. Right? So he says, I'm writing down all the answers as I'm talking to him. He says, and then we'd hang up, you know, and he says, and I'd look, and he says, I've got more questions, right? So he's like, I'd write all those questions down. He says, this went on and on and on, week after week after week, having phone calls with them. At some point, uh, Gertrude and Wilford asked him, he says, you know, can you share some information about yourself, all right? Because he had such, such, a, such a, I say, a hunger for, you know, what Lake did and Lake's material and Lake's teachings, and they said, you know, we want to hear more about you, so you know, you know, tell us your testimony. And so Curry gives them his testimonies, gave them dates of things that happened. One of the things that, when, he, when they found out that his, his life was, you know, the enemy tried to take his life when he was young, evidently Gertrude and Wilfred Wright were like, uh, we need more information about that because they remembered this prophecy that you got in your book. They had that. And they said, we need more information. What, what date was that? What date did you get run over by that car? So he had to call his mom and he called his mom and she gave him the exact date and, and um, he called Gertrude and Wilford back, and he says, this is the date. And he says, as soon as I gave him the date, he says, uh, uh, Wilford actually says, yeah, I thought that was the date. And he goes, what do you mean you thought that was the date? He says, well, he says, there's a prophecy that says that, you know, a young man's life would try to be taken then. And so we were pretty sure that that was going to be the date you came back with. And he was just like, what? He says, yeah, that prophecy also says that that young man whose life is trying to be taken at this time would be the young man that you would pass on the ministry to. And so that's kind of how that, that whole thing came about. And so um, 
he gave his testimony, gave dates, like prophecy. Um, uh, yeah, the, one of the prophecies says that he was born the, the year, yeah, he was, one of the prophecies, the prophecy says that, that Curry would be born the year that the country quits growing, 1959. And so that was the, the that was actually how, how defining this prophecy was given. Um, 25 years later to the day of Lake's death, um, Satan tries to kill Curry, Brother Curry. So again, just that's how many, because Lake had prophesied that 25 years after my death, there'll be a young man that Satan tried. So it all just lined up. So they knew this was the man that Lake had prophesied about. And so they turn, basically, they turn everything over to Brother Curry. They send them all of Lake's teachings, journals, everything. They basically send them everything. Um, December 1983, Gertrude dies. Uh, June 1987, Wilford dies. Um, passes on all remaining info to Brother Curry at that time as well. Um, told God if, or sorry, told God it will die if I can't carry it with the same power and results that Lake had. This is what Brother Curry said. You know, I need to understand. You know, I need to understand this. 1989. Um, oh yeah, so 1989. Uh, this was another day that was a huge day in Brother Curry's life. Um, this is when his daughter, his third daughter, um, Angela Rebecca Lake, fell. Excuse me, fell from the second floor of their two-story condo. I think it was a townhouse, actually. And uh, he says he remembers that day. He said he was, he was upstairs in his office. He was studying the Word, and he said he just heard this crash. And he was like this boom. You know? And he was like, what was that? He ran down. And as he ran down, he saw his daughter Rebecca laying face down on the concrete patio out back and just literally laying in a pool of blood. And so he said the first thing that happens when that happens is the enemy says, yep, you're going to bury another one. Right? And he grabbed his daughter, Rebecca, and he says, no, I will not. And he drags her in the house, drags her lifeless body in the house, props her up against the wall at the bottom of the stairs. And he says, the only thing I knew to do at this point, he says, the only thing I knew to do was just to, just to yell at her and say, you will live and not die. You will live and not die. You will live and not die. He says, for 45 minutes. He says, meanwhile, my wife's running down the stairs. She's freaking out. My son's freaking out. Everybody's panicking. He says, I literally had to turn around and tell them, shut up, either believe or be quiet, right? And he says, I went back at it again. You will live and not die. You will live and not die. He says, for 45 minutes, this goes on. This goes on and this goes on. And finally, at some point, um, you want to shut those, yeah. Uh, some, finally, at some point, uh, the, her, his daughter, who's literally slumped over, goes, just with, with this takes in a breath and, and, and kind of coughs, right? And literally coughs blood into his face and comes back to life. And he knew immediately as well. He knew again, he, he, uh, one of the things he said, you know, give her something to drink and to eat. Give her a piece of bread. Why? Because, again, that's why Jesus, remember when Jesus ra raised up the little girl and said, give her something to eat? He found out later that that is so vitally important. A doctor told him that that is so vitally important that you did that. And that's probably what saves your daughter's life as well. Because when you die your organs shut down because you're no longer alive. He says, what happens is, is when you die and you come back to life, to have something put on the tongue, like a piece of bread or something, causes the saliva glands to become active, which tells the rest of your organs, oh, we're awake now, we're alive now, right? And it, cre it actually causes the other organs to become active again, right? And so he did that and uh, put her in the hospital, put her in the ambulance, took her to the hospital. You know, they continued to pray over her, speak life over her, um, all the bones in her face, or that's my mic, all the bones in her face were healed. I mean, her, her, the broken, I think because her hands, I think, were actually crushed. They were healed as well. Um, they actually ran some, I don't know if they can run blood tests, but he talked about they ran some tests on her, um, found out that she was basically clinically dead for 45 minutes, which confirmed what he knew when he was saying, you will live and not die. So for 45 minutes, she was dead. Now, I don't know if you know anything about that, but I think after 30 minutes of no oxygen to your brain, you're, you're, brain, you're pretty much brain dead. So she was beyond that limit. So she should not be alive by any, by any intents and purposes. But how do you know? But God. Amen. So Curry got a hold of that. He, knew, he already, like he said, I didn't even know what I was doing. He says, the only thing I knew to say was you will live and not die. And just by that decreeing over her, saved her life. And so uh, actually, Rebecca actually is alive today. Well, and she's actually my age. And she actually just recently preached uh, preached down at his church in Texas not too long ago. So, amen. So, praise God. But, um, so he tries to kill his second daughter. Um, where am I here? Yeah, 1989. Um, he's still studying and researching, 1995. Um, 
Pauline Parham preaching in Houston, Texas, suburb. He goes to see Pauline Parham. Uh, while there, I took uh, uh, Miss Jeters, the daughter-in-law of the man that Lake left in charge of the church in Houston, uh, found her in a nursing home. So he found out her, found her in a nursing home, found out that she also had one of Lake's manuals. Uh, one of the things that, you know, Curry was trying to get a hold of all this time was, was a manual, because that was one of the things he found out that all of the DHTs that he trained had a manual. He's like, I need to know what's in that manual, right? So he finds this lady who's in a nursing home who has a manual, who was one time at a DHT, and so he goes and visits with her. Uh, he's like, again, it was kind of like the Gertrude and Wilford Wright situation. I'd be there every week sitting in a room with her. You know, and he, you know she, he's asking questions, and then one day he's like, I'm sitting there and asking questions, and she's answered. And finally, she, she, he's like, I could tell she was getting frustrated. And he's like, finally, she, she kind of snips at me and says, you know, if you just had a manual, you wouldn't have so many questions. And he goes, well, you have one? She goes, yeah, I got one. He said, well, can I have it? He goes, no, you can't have it, not until I die. Right? He's like, he says, so I left there that day going, Father, she's lived a really long life. <laughs> <You know? laughs> lived a really long life. You know what I mean? Father, I know. But he said, I think it was like three years later or something, uh, she had died. Or actually, I think, yeah, it's two years later, she had died. And the manual, she had promised him that when she passes away, she goes, that manual will be yours. And the manual was passed to him. Uh, he received the manual. He started studying it and ministering. And here's the thing. When he received the manual, started studying it, he began to minister different. And he says one of the things that he said that just revolutionized their ministry, uh, Curry's ministry, was the way they began to pray. You know, they, they, they were no longer asking God to heal. He says we were commanding this to happen. He says, the simple, he says the simple thing of just commanding to happen, right? He says literally, he says, our, he says by, I think by 50% or even more, success rate just jumped immediately. He says we just saw an immediate jump in success rate by just speaking and commanding this to happen instead of asking it to happen. And that was one of the things that he really got out of the manual as well. Um, he spent nine months ministering in his home, inviting people over. 100% of them were healed. Invited, he was invited onto the Sid Roth TV radio show. Uh, he here, when he was on Sid Roth, he prayed for the producer of the cancer and was instantly healed for his, for his TV producer. Um, those listening on the radio that day were instantly healed. Um, well, actually, one of, the, one of the neat things about that, I don't, he doesn't mention it in here, I don't think, but um, when he was on the Sid Roth TV show, he, he asked everybody, because I, I forget what, I think it's Sid Roth, I think it might be filmed in Texas. I think yeah, it is in Texas, because he was near his home. And uh, he said, he asked everybody, you know, under the sound of my voice, if you need healing, I want you to call into this uh, TV program. He says, give me your information and I'll come visit. He says, meanwhile, he's saying this and all the TV producers are behind the camera going, <laughs> he's like, like, why would you say that? Like, uh, he says, the phones literally started going off the hook for days. I forget how many, I forget how many phone calls they got in. I, it was thousands, right? And so Curry, <laughs> he took every one of those calls he says, and it took me weeks and weeks to do them all. He says, but I went to every person's home and ministered to every person that called into that radio program. Showed up at their door, knocked on their door. Right? He says, and usually if I told them I was coming, I'd call them ahead of time. He says, I would show up. He's like, and it wasn't just them. They had invited 15 of their friends too. He says, I, I walk in and there's a whole house load of them. You know, he's like, what in the world? You know? So he, says, he ended up being way more than even did to the people that just called in. So, but constant heal healed, just constant healed. Everybody getting healed. Everybody being ministered was healed. Um, you know, through this time of taking over John G. Lake's ministries, 50,000 DHTs have been trained and now getting results. Uh, now training, they are now training on an average of 10,000 DHTs per year. So uh, new divine healing technicians are being added every year. Um, uh, just in, just for just Brother Curry, nine raised from the dead. Uh, two babies in the womb, dead for two weeks, raised back to life. One woman in a morgue came back. Angelo, who was shot by his uncle, died and came back. That's a kind of a neat story. If you have to go listen to Brother Curry about that one, he, you can find it on YouTube, but he talks about Angelo. It's when Brother Curry was invited to Italy to do a DHT, and he showed up there, and a guy, I guess the guy who was kind of running this, or the DHT order, I guess hosting it, his, his, this, his, you know, this guy was shot in, his, in the back by his uncle, and so Curry went to the hospital, and he's basically laying on life support, and he goes in there and lays hands on him, right? And he said, you know, he just commanded life to come back into him. He comes back out, and he says, everybody stand on the outside of the hospital room. He's like, Brother Curry, like, you know, what did God speak to you? And he's like, believers shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And they looked at him like, okay, well, what, God did speak, what did God speak to you? Like, believers shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Well, he goes back, he goes, I go back to my hotel room, and he says, and it's later that night, I get a knock on my door, right? And he says, and here, he opens his hotel room door, and here's, here's this guy standing in front of him. It's like one of Angelo's 
friends or I don't know, maybe his brother. He says, um, Brother Curry, um, Angelo, Angelo, he died. Angelo dead. He says, Curry's standing there and he goes, hmm. Surprises me. He shuts his door. <laughs> right? Shuts his door. Right? And he's like, he says, I go back over and I tell my wife, he says, I'm going for a walk. He says, and my wife knows if I usually tell her I'm going for a walk, he says, it means I'm going to pray. He says, and I went out for a walk, he says, and for 45 minutes I walked around my hotel rock, he says, praying in tongues, loud, strong, just going, going at it in the spirit, just praying in tongues. He says, and until I felt the release. He says, I went up, went to bed that night. He says, I get up the next morning. He says, I show up at the DHT. He says, I walk in. Everybody's rejoicing. And they come up, Brother Curry, Brother Curry, Brother Curry. They're grabbing a hold of him. Haven't you heard the news? Haven't you heard the news? And he's like, what's the news? He says, Angelo, he lived. Angelo, he lived. He says, that's right. Because why? Believers will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Right? So these are some of the things that you will see as you begin to walk and minister in this divine healing. Amen? Amen. So um, cancer is healed. AIDS have been healed. Epilepsy has epilepsy been healed. Leukemia has been healed. Tuberculosis healed. Blindness healed. Totally blind. Seeing, uh, seeing light through his glass eye. There's actually a guy he ministered. Now seeing through a glass eye. Isn't that amazing? Uh, deafness healed. Down syndrome healed. Missing organs replaced. Removed organs recreated. Short limbs lengthened. Um, John Lake had 20,000 healings per year. JJLM now experiences 30,000 healings per month. That's how much the ministry has grown and expanded. The good old days were meant to be surpassed. That's why I said everybody wants to talk about going back to the good old days. You don't want to go back to the good old days. We're actually to, we're to grow from the good old days. Amen? A little girl in North Carolina with leukemia, three to four transfusions per week, she's been healed. A little Spanish girl in Dodge City, Kansas, healed. Man with a steel rod in his back in Harrisburg, PA, right up the road here, healed. Remember the story about that. Brother Curry shared about that. She said that he prayed for that man. He had a steel rod in his back. This man, he says this man came up to the healing line. He said he couldn't even bend over, right? I mean, just literally fused together. I mean, the man could not bend over like this, right? Praise for him. I mean, what I, I even said, when I say pray for him, please understand I'm saying minister's healing to them. We don't pray for the sick, right? We minister healing to the sick. Minister's healing to him. Here's the thing. Man can't bend. Nothing, nothing's changed instantly, right? But we don't move off of that position. Minister's healing moves down the line. Then the guy goes back to his hotel room that night, lays in his hotel room, goes to bed, wakes up in the morning with the steel rod laying next to him in his, next to him in his bed, brings it back to Brother Curry and shows, here, it's gone, and completely bends over. That happened in Harrisburg, right here in our backyard. Anything's possible with God. Come on, church. Anything's possible. Um, <clears throat> where are we at here? Uh, Harrisburg, yeah, woman uh, in normal, Ill normal Ill Illinois, crippled for seven years, healed. Man with Parkinson's in Dallas at David Hogan meeting, completely healed. Uh, dead girl in Virginia could, could hear better. Dead, yeah, I'll say deaf girl. <laughs> deaf, I, I, oh, a dead girl healing be hearing better is pretty good too, I guess. A deaf girl in Virginia hearing better, and then her mother. Uh, paralyzed, you know, pastor paralyzed in mo motorcycle accident, healed. He had a 10% chance to live, 0% chance to walk, held a three, day sir, three days later, totally healed. Uh, paralyzed man in, on a cot in Portland, walked in the meeting. Portland, Oregon, man with terminal cancer healed. Angelo in Italy, that's the one I was talking about, shot by uncle. Life support, died and came back. Thai woman, cancer, totally healed. Went to hospital later for breathing, gave wrong medicines. She died, she saw Jesus, came back. She was a Buddhist. She was no longer a Buddhist after that day, trust me. Thai woman uh, with AIDS, uh, John, actually his son John, commanded this woman with AIDS, in the, and the AIDS went. Doctors confirmed the AIDS was gone. Uh, John also, his son John, witnessed a Buddhist woman praying for rain. John commanded no rain for three days, then rain. The village opened up to the gospel. And sound like Elijah, who commanded no rain, right? And then he says, and it won't rain till I say it'll rain. And then three days later, oh, John did that. Watch, three days later it rains, and that guess what? It opens up a whole village to the message of Jesus. That's walking in dominion. Right? Um, Jehovah's Witnesses uh, on the side of the road, healed, uh, ministered to, set free. Boy, boy that stole car, killed in chase, raised from the dead. Uh, man with a heart attack, raised by the cell phone. I remember he told the story about that. Through a cell phone. Brother Curry on the phone. Told him to come back to life, and he comes back to life. Man in Jacksonville, Florida, brain dead for 13 days, had a contagious virus, raised... He was healed, raised two babies in the womb as well. Uh, deacon and deaf woman in Grand Junction, Colorado, both healed instantly. Woman dropped dead in service in Harrisburg, PA, after he left, after girl the curry had left, that was when he was in Harrisburg, the same meeting with the man and the steel rod in his back. After, so after he leaves, a, a woman drops dead in their service, they raised her back up to life. 
Why? And thank God that he was there to, to teach them for three days, so then after three days, they could do it themselves. See, here's the thing we've got to realize, and I've got to watch my time here. We're good. Yeah, we're good for a while. Here's the thing we've got to realize. When you... <laughs> how do I say this? Authority and dominion requires responsibility. Right? If you're going to walk in authority and you're going to walk in dominion and you're going to walk in divine health and you're going to be a minister of the gospel that ministers health to people and healing to people, you walk in responsibility. Right? You're responsible for it. Now, see, that's one of the main things that Christians have a huge problem with. And a lot of the times we build up these sacred cows because we don't want to have responsibility. Because if it doesn't work, then we have something to fall back on. Right? Well, God must have not healed him because X, Y, Z. Or, you know, well, maybe he died because it just was God... You know, this is another one that's just nails on a chalkboard for, chalkboard for me, especially for young kids. You know, God needed another angel. And they'll put that even on the, on the, on the casket, you know, another angel in heaven. And God doesn't need to kill your little baby to have another angel. Your, your baby in heaven doesn't receive wings and, and is, an, is an angel anymore, right? I mean, God doesn't need to do that, you know? That's just, again, it's another, what it is, it's another outlet that makes us feel comfortable about the loved one that we lost. Right? Instead of accepting the responsibility that we messed up and we failed. I remember it wasn't long ago, we had a lady I was ministering to, and just because we're recording, I won't say names and stuff, but you know, um, it, it hit me hard because we were ministering to her. She had, she had cancer, and uh, we were seeing victory. You know, we were seeing victory. Just as I'm talking about, we were seeing victory. We were seeing good things, and you know, we went over to her house several times and ministered with her, and um, you know, I remember getting the call the morning she had passed away, and I didn't deal with it good. You know, I sat on the back porch, and I sat on our swing, and I was, I was a mess. And, you know, she, had, she came out and talked to, me, talked to me for a while, but I sat back there, and I talked to God for a long time because I was mad. You know, I wasn't mad at God. But I was mad at myself. Wasn't his fault, even though I had a lot of. Even though I got a lot of, I still got a lot of questions. You know, and and, and that's one of the things you know, like Brother Curry said to Texas. Actually, I shared that testimony at church the other day. You know, that man was like, you know, he's like, I was going around praying for everybody. Everybody was getting healed. And I don't even know what I'm doing. Brother Curry's like, I got news for you. None of us know what we're doing. We're just ministering what we've been given. It's the life of God. We do our part. He does his. You know, and and. It wasn't that I was mad at God. It wasn't that I was like, oh man, you know, God, why didn't you do this one? Why didn't you do this one? It was like, God, what am I missing? What am I? Because it's my fault. She shouldn't, she shouldn't be dead. She should be seeing her grandkids graduating from high school. She should be there celebrating this day. But now, I, now hear my heart. I know where she's at. There's just no doubt she's with her Lord and Savior, right? But she went too early. It's not the Lord's will that she went that early. It's not the Lord's will she died of cancer. Right? And I, I accept that responsibility. And people, you know, I even said this, I even said to one of their family members, you know, I apologize. I accept the responsibility that this woman did not make it. And she said, please don't do that. I said, no, no. I said, I accept the responsibility. I said, because you know what? Because most Christians won't. Most Christians will brush it off and say, you know, well, it was probably because of this, or it's probably because of that, or maybe it was her time, or maybe it wasn't God's will. No, no. It was my fault. You know, and, and, and at the end of the day, what it does is it drives me to do better. It should. It should drive us to be better, to walk better, to keep this message pure, to walk in power, to walk in authority, to walk in dominion that we're called to walk in, and to not let the enemy hinder us. It should cause us to push harder, go further, be stronger. I mean, it should, it should cause us to grow. We use these situations where we fail. God didn't fail. Where I failed... And I use it to make me to learn, to grow. Why? Because here's the reality. Even though I accept responsibility, there's grace and room to grow. Why? Because God gives us grace. He gives us room to grow. Right? But at the end of the day, Jesus, when the disciples couldn't cast the demon out of the boy, he didn't turn to the disciples and say, it's okay. You're not born again yet. You haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit yet. It's okay. No, what did he say? He says, it's because of your unbelief. He rebuked them. He actually, I think it's in Luke, he actually says, you faithless and perverse generation. Wow, he rebukes them. 
right? And so he doesn't, in other words, he doesn't cut his own disciples any slack. And we shouldn't cut ourselves any slack, right? And the disciples learned that day. It was my fault. It was because I had unbelief. And we'll get into that a little bit later, and I'll explain to you, I think, why the disciples had unbelief and what they saw and why, why they saw what they saw caused them to have unbelief because they saw the boy wow, you know, foaming at the mouth, wallowing on the ground. I mean, they, I believe, I honestly believe the disciples saw the severity of the situation and they got their eyes on the circumstance rather than walking by the Spirit and walking in what they knew. Because that's the reality. When we get our eyes off, the, off of the truth and we get our eyes on the circumstance, we take our eyes off of what's the most important, the Word of God. What does the Word of God say over that situation? The Word of God says that woman is healed. The Word of God says that man is healed. The Word of God says that woman is raised from the dead. So do it. It's our job to do it. James, James says, don't be, deceiver, or don't be deceived. Right? Don't be like the man that looks in the mirror, sees who he is, and then turns away and forgets who he was. Right? Be the man. Why? Don't be just a hearer only, but be what? A doer. We're called to do this word. We're not called just to hear this word. We're not called to read this word. We're not called just to sit here for three days and then do nothing. Right? You're going to be here for three days. Guess what? At the end of these three days, you have accepted a whole bunch of responsibility. At the end of these three days, Saturday night when we have a healing service, guess what? I'll be there ministering with you, but you all will be laying hands on the sick. Why? Because that's the only way you're going to learn. That's the only way you're going to grow. I don't know about you. I, I, any career I've ever held, any job I've ever held, whenever I've held a career or had a job as far as like secular jobs, please understand, if I had to learn a new trade or learn a new skill, I could read the manual front and back until I, 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 until I was blue in the face, until I remember, I could read it and read it and read it. And, there's paper in my Bible. I could read it and read it and read it, right? But I really wouldn't truly learn it until I got my hands on the tools and did it. That's how I learn, and that is how you learn. You're not going to learn by just reading the Word of God constantly. You will renew your mind, which is good, but also renew it to a degree. Because renewing your mind to a degree is just reading the Word, memorizing the Word, meditating on the Word. But to a larger part of the degree, renewing your mind is actually doing the Word of God. Because what you do is you then solidify in your mind and in your body and in your soul that I believe what this word says, that I will do what this word says, that I will receive the great commission to go into all the world, to, to set the captives free, to make disciples of all nations, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cast out demons. I receive this commission, so therefore I receive responsibility to do what I'm called to do. And that's why I said at the end of the day, most Christians don't want to receive responsibility or accept responsibility. We'd rather say, well, you know, it's this reason or that reason. Or we'd be okay. A lot of Christians are okay with just sitting in a service, sowing money, and saying, you go, I'll sit here. But they do. Every Sunday, they think, well, I'll just put my, I'll put my money in the offering plate, and God will use that, and God, God will spread the gospel through someone else. That's not you going. That's you sowing but that ain't you going. You are called to go until you're told not to. You hear me? We are to assume that we're called to go to reach the lost, to preach the gospel, to heal the sick, until we're told not to. I even say this all the time. It's the great commission, not the great suggestion. There's no other option. Right? And I don't understand where Christians get this idea that they can make the rules and they can just choose and decide what they want to do. There's no other option other than to preach the gospel, make disciples, set the captives free to do the works that Jesus did. We don't get another option. You know? Yeah, you may have a secular job, but that's not your career. You hear me? Your career is a preacher of the gospel, is a minister of the word of God. That's your position. That's who you're called to be. I remember Brother Curry shared this. He it, when, he, when his first daughter was born, he was, working for fa he was working for a fast food joint. He was a manager of a fast food place when his daughter was born. And actually, he managed a lot of fast food places because he found freedom in working in fast food. He says, he says honestly, I had more time with the Lord working fast food than I did when I was actually a minister or a, or a pastor of a church. I had more free time, right? He says, I would, I'd be back. He said, I'd, I'd be back in the office. And he says, as, all my, as long as all my stuff's done, I got all my paperwork done. He says, I'd, I'd, the Word of God would be open. I'd be studying. I'd be, I'd be right, digging in. You know, oh, someone need me? Okay, I'd go fix that situation. I'd, right, I'd come back. I had more freedom. He said, working fast food, I had a lot of time. He says, especially working you know, the night hours. He said, he worked the night hours. 
And so he would do that. But he said, when his daughter was born, here he says, I'm, I'm a manager of a fast food place. My daughter's born. And they, they asked me to put on the birth certificate the occupation of the father. He put minister of the gospel. He had no ordination. He had no licensing. He had nothing. He had, well, he had a call from God. Right? And so he knew that his occupation, his true occupation was this. I am a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I work in a fast food place, but I am a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no other option for us. And I had someone talking to me the other day about, you know, we homeschool our daughter, and we do, we homeschool our daughter, and you know, and she's actually going through DBI right now. She's doing the two-year Bible school, and uh, I did the two-year Bible school. It's amazing. If you, ever, if you want more information about DBI, come see me. But, you know, people are like, you know, you're in Bible school, that's awesome. Yeah, because there's nothing else other to do, you know. I'm kind of like Brother David Hogan. He talked one time about his boys. He, you know, he homeschooled his boys. And if you know Brother David Hogan, he has a, um, a huge work down in Mexico, and he, he ministers to what he calls, they call them Indians, natives, and uh, has, I think, planted like 500 churches in Mexico out in, out in the villages. And, and uh, you know, he's taught his sons to preach the gospel. He says, honestly, he says, if they want to learn how to do anything else, he says they can pay for it on their own. He says, as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing else to do. I've taught them how to preach the gospel, how to be ministers of the gospel, how to start churches, how to do... He says, because there's nothing else to do. He says, if they want to go get a secular career and do something else, he says, they can pay for it themselves. He says, but I'm not doing that. You know, we need to... We need to you know, go read Psalm 78. Go read it, I promise you. It talks about if we, don't, if we don't train our children in the ways they should go, they'll forget God. And it, and it actually gives you an examples of all the people that forgot God and what happened to them. We are responsible for our children. You think, Pastor Shane, why are you talking about this? What's this got to do with DHC? I don't know, but someone's pulling on it right now. Someone, some, some of you, one of you in this room need to hear this. Somebody's pulling on this. We are responsible for our children. Your children don't belong to the local school district. Your children don't belong to this government. Your children are given to you by God. They are a blessing from our Heavenly Father. You are called to raise them up in the way they should go. They're your responsibility. Someone needs to hear that in this room. The Holy Spirit is pulling on that to come out. But um, let's see what time is it. We got, you know, we're almost. Now we got a couple minutes here. All right, let's let's kind of get into this first section, and when we come back from dinner, we will finish this next section. But we're gonna just kind of set the set the tone for when we come back uh, after dinner. But uh, section three is called the final authority, the basis of discussion. So if anything, we're gonna have a basis of discussion for when we come back. It is this that the word is our final authority. Amen? If we're going to talk about anything this week, or this next couple of days, everything that we talk about, we're going to have to agree that what we're talking about is the Word of God, right? Because if it's anything else, then we, can, then we have room for argument, right? But if all we talk about is what's in here, we can agree on that, right? We're not going to, we're not going to talk about things and be like, well, I can't really find... No, no, no. What we talk about is going to be in here because how many know you can't argue with this Word? You can't argue with it, right? Because if you're going to argue with this word, you're going to argue with God, right? I, I'll even say this. This may be a little harsh, but I'll, I'll say it because it needs to be said. If I choose, pick and choose what scriptures to believe, right? I, I in a sense, am denying Jesus Christ. Jesus was the word made flesh. So if I pick a scripture out of here and I say, okay, well, this scripture says that all should be healed or all can be healed. Well, I don't know if I believe that. What I've done is I've denied Christ because he was the word made flesh. And Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father. Then we wonder, why don't people get healed? Well, you denied him. And he says, if you deny me, I'll deny you before my father. So if you're going to say, well, I don't know if healing's for today, then Jesus is going to say, well, see, father, they denied me, so we can't do anything about that. See what I'm saying? See, God himself has even set himself to the boundary of his word. God won't go beyond the boundary that he set, right? And so we're going to look at that when we come back. We're going to look at how God has forever settled his word in heaven. We must settle it here on earth. That's the next statement there. And when we come back, let's actually, we'll, we'll stop here. When we come back, we're going to look at Psalm 119. We're going to break into that. Uh, we'll, go, we'll go look into that. But please understand what I'm saying, though, is you know, the, the, the word of God is our final authority. You know, if we're going to deny scripture... We are, and I used to say to a degree denying Jesus, but we are, not even to a degree. We, if we deny Scripture, we're denying Him because He was the Scripture lived out. Amen? Okay, cool. Let's, uh, let's break for dinner. Let's plan on being, it's 345. Uh, we are going to start up on time at 6 p.m. 
So um, we're going to start up on time. I actually gives you a little over two hours. So we're trying to run each session about 45 minutes. Um, in the back, uh, there is some papers. For those of you that aren't local or maybe you just kind of you know, don't know Littlestown that well, um, there is some papers in the back on that table of some food options around town. So if you want to uh, go find a place to eat, um, there's food options there. There's the, the addresses, the phone numbers. You can put in your GPS. You can find them, get some, get some dinner. We'll get back here. We'll meet back here at 6 p.m. We're going to start, start at 6 p.m. sharp because we've got three more sessions to get through. And we'll get through them this evening, and we're going to have a good time. Amen? You all getting something out of this? You enjoying this? Amen. Praise God. All right. I'm excited for this afternoon because we're going to get into some of the good stuff. Amen? Amen. Go, well, go enjoy dinner. And listen, as you're enjoying dinner, your waitress, your waiter, the person serving you, guess what? That's an opportunity to show Jesus to them. It's an opportunity to minister. Amen? Praise God. Go, go be Jesus.